So I've been asked quite a bit, Cameron, what do you play against d4? Or what do you recommend playing against d4? And the truth is, I've sort of put off answering it because the answer is a little complicated. I've experimented the most playing with the black pieces, whereas with white, I've pretty much stuck to the same thing since I started playing chess. But if I could go back in time to when I was first starting to become much more comfortable with opening principles and understanding that I needed to react to my opponent's moves instead of just doing my own thing on my side of the board, this is the advice I would give myself playing against d4. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that this video is sponsored by Brilliant.org. Brilliant is the best way to learn things like math, computer science, and data science interactively. They have thousands of lessons that cover basic to advanced topics. So whether you want to brush up on your math skills or learn about artificial neural networks, Brilliant has something for you. It's free and it's super easy to sign up. Everything is customizable to fit your needs so you can work at your own pace. Each lesson is fun and has interactive elements. My favorite one so far is the logic one that involves putting robots in the correct order based on logical deductions. You can try Brilliant for free for 30 days at brilliant.org slash Cameron. The first 200 signups will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. That's brilliant.org slash Cameron. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. So jumping right in, if your opponent starts off the game with d4, my immediate recommendation is just go d5. And there are plenty of other openings in the C. There are even other move orders that will lead to similar positions as we're going to look at. But in terms of opening principles, I think it's really important to learn how to strike and fight at the center right away. So after you reach this very basic starting position, your opponent has a few options, but you're most often going to face um, one of just a few things, either the London system where the bishop comes out to f4, um, either on this move or, you know, a few moves later, or you're going to face the queen's gambit and all the openings that sort of stem from this setup where white at some point plays the move c4. And starting off with the queen's gambit, you can take this pawn, um, but the more solid option and the one that's going to lead to a lot of pawn structures that you will see in a lot of openings is playing the queen's gambit decline. If you're looking for tricks and traps, this is not really the video for you. I wish I would have started playing queen's gambit declined a lot earlier in my chess career, just because the pawn structure is so similar to so many other things. And if you can get comfortable playing in these kinds of positions, you will have such a leg up on people who are around your rating. So queen's gambit decline, totally fine, totally solid if they decide to trade in the center right away or a couple of moves later. The basic plan in the Queen's Gambit declined, right? It's really opening principles, which is develop your pieces and get your king to safety. And if we play a little bit into the most common moves in the chess.com database, um, we'll see that black is very easily able to get all of their pieces developed. It's a very equal game all the way up to move eight. And this is where I would technically consider the opening phase of the game to be done. And here's where we're gonna go just a little bit further so I can tell you the sort of middle game plans that you're gonna have in these types of positions. So first of all, let's notice the pawn structure. We have a very solid pawn pyramid here. So if white ever takes in the center, we can take back with either of these two pawns and we still have a very solid position. There's no isolated hanging pawns anywhere. We are just very solid. However, we usually don't want to leave our pawns like this forever. Eventually the plan is going to be to support either the push of the E pawn or the C pawn in the event that white doesn't actually trade in the center and get our pieces more active. Our main problem piece in this position is the light squared bishop because it's just blocked in by all the pawns, right? If white ever does something like this and starts to lock down the queen side, First of all, we move our bishop, but then that gives us even more incentive to push this pawn, break open the e-file, and get our pieces really active and aiming over here at the white king. This opening also teaches you how to think a little bit more prophylactically. So, for example, if you see that your opponent is doing something crazy, like pushing so many pawns in the center just to crash down the center, it's really not that scary. You can just develop your pieces normally, and if white ever ends up pushing e4 just take it it doesn't matter if it's near the beginning of the game or a little bit further into the middle game just take it you're not worried about losing the peak of your pawn pyramid because you have such solid control um you know once you push the c pawn over the d5 square that white's trying to crash down the middle of the board isn't really an attack and it's eventually just kind of going to piddle out so queen's gambit decline structure transfers to a lot of different positions it can transfer to something like the Catalan, where white's going to try and fianchetto this bishop. 
Um, there's lines where you can take this pawn once it's clear the bishop is not going to stay on this diagonal. But in that case, then you really have to be careful of this long diagonal because if you're pushing pawns on the queen side to try and hang on to the pawn that you've won, there's a very real possibility, and this has happened to me way too many times, um, of this rook just getting trapped and, and being won very early in the game. So when the position opens up, you have to be careful of things like that, but otherwise it's really just about normal development. So we can bring our bishop out here to blunt any attack if that bishop were to come out to pin our knight. Knight f3, we can castle if the bishop comes out, you know, we're ready to defend with something like this. So at the end of the day, again, this is kind of the position that you're after, and it's really about opening principles, developing your pieces, when in doubt, get pieces out, get your king to safety, and then this is kind of the key pawn structure that you'll see in a lot of different openings. And if you become comfortable playing in this type of pawn structure and just playing really solid chess, it's going to make it a lot easier for you to understand when your opponent has made some opening deviation or some mistake that you can capitalize on. Now, the London is kind of a different beast, and I should know because I've played it almost exclusively with the white pieces for pretty much my entire short chess career. You can actually play it with a pretty similar pawn structure to the Queen's Gambit Declined. The difference, of course, in the London is that after d4, d5, um, the bishop can come out or the knight can come out. It doesn't really matter the move order. Let's say bishop comes out. I think that's pretty much the most popular. I usually like to start with the knight coming out first just because often there can be tactics or a way to quickly win this strong bishop if you'd really like to get aggressive. And I would suggest trying different things because the London is a really tough egg to crack. And so if you just try out a couple different ideas, for example, you can play the copycat variation where you bring the bishop out here. You can play it very solid with just the similar queen's gambit to client structure, bringing this pawn up here, um, bringing the bishop out, hoping to trade it off right away. If you can get rid of this London bishop as soon as possible, that's usually your best course of action earlier in the game. But I would also recommend if your opponent does not play the move c4, at some point, you should try to play the move c5. And what does this do? Well, immediately it's striking at the center. You can play it on in a variety of move orders. You can play it as early as move two, and there's some tricks that go along with that. Um, I usually like to save it for a little bit later in the game because gambiting this pawn can lead to some fun lines and interesting lines, but it's sometimes a little bit tricky to play if you're not exactly super well up on the theory. And again, we're looking to play solid chess here. We're not looking to get some sort of a trick in the first 10 moves. We're looking to learn how to play super basic types of positions because that's what you're gonna have to do if you want to become a stronger chess player. And so if white gives you the option of playing C4, um, there's a lot of ways that you can go with this as like sort of a middle game plan. You can push and just expand on the queen side and just sort of run your pawns down that side of the board. You can also just leave it there, develop normally. You can fianchetto this bishop this way, or you can leave this bishop here and just sort of wait to get the e-pawn out of the way. There are other interesting ideas too to get London players sort of out of their comfort zone by bringing the queen out to b6, which at a certain level sort of becomes the main line. Um, but if white is just playing passively here, we can go like this. And if white defends, we can actually push, force the trade. And now we've got doubled b-pawns, but we can push those up the board and force some tactics on the side of the board pretty early. But of course, the more solid recommendation is just to develop pieces that I can either go here or here. Trade off this dark squared bishop if possible. A lot of times white will prevent that by putting the knight on e5. If white allows you to have some control over this e5 square, that's really where the battle in the middle game is going to be fought, is on these two squares. If you can get control of one of these two squares, usually for black it actually ends up being the e4 square, but if white is playing really passively and you can somehow force the e-pawn forward, that is often going to end the game really quickly because, first of all, white just isn't going to know what to do, but also gaining space in the center of the board is going to push the pieces back. A lot of times you'll even get pawn forks if white is just mindlessly developing their pieces. And so, again, controlling the center is really important in these d4 types of positions. So, of course, this video is not meant to be some sort of end-all expert recommendation for all players of all levels. I'm still learning a lot about openings too, especially as being a relatively new chess player, I just simply haven't had the time to explore a lot of different openings. But again, if I could go back a couple years ago and give myself a little bit of advice, it would be to play these more solid pawn structures and really feel comfortable with the positional play that you're going to get out of these ideas. And also mix it up. I, I found it really helpful to just try out different openings and see which ones feel the most intuitive to me. 
and just kind of go from there. It, it's really fun, especially at the lower levels, to experiment with different things because your opponent most likely is also not going to know what they're doing. Uh, so the opening is the time to try new things out. I hope this video gave you some ideas of how to play solidly against 1v4. If you like this video, please consider subscribing. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you soon.